There'd be a lot of poop in my hands. <laughs> I've seen a six foot alligator go swinging through the air and slam into a tree. These guys are the scientists of the supernatural, lecturers leaving lessons for inquiring laymen. They are applying the scientific method to a world that baffles science. They are the cryptids of the corn. But who else has big black wings and red eyes? Um, Batman. Oh, Mothman. Oh yeah, Mothman. A great white shark was stolen. Oh, someone stole a shark? I got stuff for you you don't even know about. She's a witch. She turned me into a newt. Who knows? Anything could be possible. Anything could be possible. It's really big mm -hmm. abduction vibes. Holy moly. It sounds like you were abducted. And it just stood up. I mean, it just like kept going and going. And she goes, what the... I am, uh, I'm trying to be the great and powerful mystery today, but I'm just feeling like the mystery. You gotta be great and powerful. Uh, let me try it again. Okay. Hey guys, welcome back. I am the great and powerful mystery. There we go. Just force it into existence. Hell yeah. Talk it. And who are you? I'm J-Clone68. Is that the, the uh, she, she, she shanty J-Clone? I think that was 47. Oh well, I need a I need a aquatic one. Well, give me an aquatic J clone. Is it sixty eight? What does sixty eight do? Oh, he's just he's a raspberry picker. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, I, for anybody listening to this, it's what Jay was doing this morning. He was picking raspberries. Yeah, got a nice got a nice collection there for you. Yeah, I'm gonna try to make uh, jam for us. No jelly, jelly. No jelly. Yeah. I'm gonna try to do jelly, and I'm gonna try to do jalapeno jelly too. Kinda don't have jalapenos. I have something a lot hotter. Scotch bonnet jelly. Now, that is one. I've seen that at the store. Hmm. And because scotch bonnets are really good for cooking. Yeah. If you, like, Make just use a tiny bit of them. Mm -hmm. Like, people... They're I, hot. I don't think that's what people get about them, is they have amazing flavor complexes, but they also have 650,000 Scoville Scoble, units. Yeah. Burn your tongue off. Today's episode is all about Captain Seabury... Okay. Sea berry, raspberry of oh, the sea. The connections. Versus a monster. Ooh. He karate chops one. That's pretty intense. Uh, but oh, we want to thank Andy, because Andy's the one that brought me to this story. Andy Artichoke. Oh, okay. Arugula. Arugula. Yeah. What, I mean, Andy, you know who you are, but it just is funny because I can never say his last name right. Uh, I'm going to run through the top of house stuff really fast. Um, Paranormality Magazines, we're affiliate. Use our link. Uh, use our code, crypto, our corn crew. Uh, we get yeah. a kickback. <laughs> YouTube, get us on YouTube. We have all kinds of stuff on there. Like, share, From, subscribe, follow. Please subscribe. We're so close to, like, literally, hit, it's right under the threshold for money. Hit that bell. Voicemails, if you want to hear your own voice on the show, you can call in and say hi uh, on the speaker pipe link. Or you want, if you have an encounter you want us to do for a Wednesday episode, call in on the speaker pipe. P.O. Box is, uh, it's P.O. Box 75, Ada, Ohio, 45810, and that is A-D-A, -A, not all the other weird ways to spell Ada. If you want to send us weird art or just something fun in general for the studio. If you're going to send anthrax, make sure it's marked clearly for J. Oh, gosh. Well, you're clones. It's I just, can handle it, yeah. We got we replace them. Merch, we have all of the merch. The summer shirts will be ending at the end of September. They'll be pulled off the website forever. So it's soon. So that's the Oceanic Crocodile versus the Orca and the Antarctic uh, Sea Crab Spiders that are hunting me and Jay down in the Antarctic tunnels. So get them while they're still there, I guess. Uh, conferences. Uh, really coming up really soon. We have Mothman. We're going to be walking around. Pay attention to Facebook and Instagram to where we're going to be and hang out and stuff like that. We're not vending, but we're there. Uh, and then the weekend after that is the Hocking Hills Bigfoot Conference. Get your tickets online. Get your tickets for that. That's a charity event, too. Come spend some money for charity. Mm -hmm. Good uh, cause. It's a very good cause. And the amazing lady that runs it. And then our conference is October 6th through the 8th. 40 and Airwaves. Oh, yeah. And we're there with all these guys. You've heard us talk about it all this time. Please, if you want to come hang out, we appreciate it. Don't feel like you don't feel necessary. But it is an all-weekend event. 
and it's going to be con- tons and tons of fun. There's a very limited number of tickets, so you'll get time with us. We want to do that and make sure that you know it wasn't too big for that reason. The ultimate podcast experience. And then our last one for the year is Crypticon, and we'll talk mm. about that one when it gets closer. That's right, Paul. <laughs> Paul. We love Paul. There's your shout-out, Paul. What? Which Paul? Do, do, Milk. Do, 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 do. Oh, I was just going to leave it up, though. Oh, okay. Hi, Paul Allen. <laughs> uh, if you guys are coming to shows, let us know once again. We love to just try to learn names and like before you get there. It doesn't work out every time, uh, but it works out sometimes. And if you want to get in contact with the show for scheduling, get us at a conference, all that kind of stuff, it's the Crypt of the Corn Podcast at gmail.com for all that goody stuff. Uh, new reviews. So here we go. These are all Apple reviews. Ooh. Uh, this is from uh, Aero, Aerolio? Areola? Oh, gosh. No, I don't think so. Oh. A-R-L-E-N-E-O. Oh, I don't know. Okay. Great Britain. She said, or they say, great podcast. And says, love the variety of topics. Very interesting. Very likable host who are knowledgeable. Definitely one of the more unique paranormal podcasts out there because they tend to discuss lesser known subjects. I nearly dropped a star because the audio can be iffy on rare occasions. Only a slight annoyance, though. Thank you. Well, thank you for oh, the five you. stars. And then uh, Big D86 says, fantastic. These guys are a fresh take on the supernatural. Uh, I'm sorry, binging the ga- bridging the gap between traditional science and the paranormal. I love the topics and the perspectives. Keep up the good work, boys. Hmm. Thank, Thank you, you, Big D. And then from Karak, Karakin? Kraken? No, no. Karak. Okay. Karakin. Okay. Uh, Nundy bear or mandrills? I believe some of these Nundy bear sightings could possibly be mandrill encounters. And I can agree. Do you know what a mandrill is? Nope. Uh, most people call them baboons. Okay. They're the, they're the ones that kind of look like baboons with all the crazy colors and the big bright, bright red butts. Yeah. That's a mandrill. Oh, okay. They're not baboons. Interesting. But people off it because they're very close to the related right, species. Just, yeah. So is Rafiki a mandrill? Yes. Oh, okay. Rafiki's a mandrill, not a baboon. Gotcha. Uh, and they are, mandrills are known to steal kids and all this stuff and eat brains. and like. So I can see, I can definitely see where they're coming from from this. Good Lord. Oh, yeah. No, mandrills, man, mandrill and baboons. Are very scary mm. animals. Okay. All right. And then uh, we don't have any patrons because we're public recording right now. But uh, get on our Patreon. We do hangouts. We do, like, uh, either special shops. There's all this cool stuff. There's the Discord. All this amazing stuff. Yeah. All right. Anything else, Jay, before we get into this? I'm ready for Mr. Seabury. Who's Seabury? Mr. Waterbury, Seabury. Wait, Waterbury. That's Happy Gilmore. I don't know. I'm ready for him. All right. So we're going to talk about sea monsters today. Who was the berry guy you were talking about? Seabury, Captain Seabury. Oh, I was right. Okay. Seabury, Seabury, I don't know. Okay. It is not. Okay. There's how the article starts. Oh, sorry. Just sit right back and you'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip. They started from Bedford Port aboard a tiny ship. Mm -hmm. This mate was mighty, staling man, and the skipper brave and sure. Those whaling men set the day for a three-year tour. A three-year tour. tour. The weather started getting rough. The tiny ship was tossed. If not for the courage of the fearless crew, the manga Hala would be lost. The manga Hala would be lost. Okay. Did you like my little song? I guess so. Yo, come on. Yeah, it was good. It's Gilligan's good Island. That's what I thought it was. I, I was just, like, I'm sick, and I, it's hard. I was going to say, is this Gilligan's Island we were done? But I guess so. <laughs> All right. You want me to try again? Just sit right back in here, a tale, a tale, a fateful trip. This is better. <laughs> they started from the Bedford port aboard their tiny ship. The mates were mighty sailing men, the skipper brave and sure. And sure. Those whaling men set sail for a three-year tour. A three-year tour. tour. The weather started getting rough. Their tiny ship was tossed. tossed. If not for the courage of the fearless crew, the manga Hala would be lost. lost. The manga Hala would be lost. Much better. There we go. Wait, do the little. Yeah. Oh gosh, I'm getting there. <clears throat> there we go. Oh, okay, okay, close transition. <laughs> I thought it said cheer, not chimes. Oh. I'm not feeling good, everybody, just so we're all clear. Okay. You ready for this, though? Yes. What's the topic? I, I like, like starting with a song whenever I can. 
Well, <laughs> you did. In nineteen or in 1852, a whaling ship named the Mongahela, under the command of Captain Jan- or John or Jason Seabury, set out to sail New Bedford, Massachusetts, in search for the fruitful hunting grounds of sperm whales. So this is at the height of the whaling industry. Okay. Uh, and this is actually when a lot of these sea monsters were being encountered in both the New and the Old World, which makes a lot of sense because they're hunting extremely large animals. Right. They're so targeting any, them. Yeah. So any big animal you see on the horizon can uh, come on the chopping block pretty quick. Uh, by January 13th, look at the spotted signs of, uh, of cetaceans and sea life activity. The Captain Seabury maneuvered the Mangahela into position to pursue what they had hoped to be their intended prey. The longboats were ready for launch. The lookout kept their eyes close on the white water, which indicated something large was moving just beneath the surface of the ocean. And the crew held their collective breath and possibly for such uh, for a fortuitous discovery. The black patch of skin was uh, visible briefly, and the creature dived back underwater. The flabbergasted lookout from the lofty position declared that it was what he was seeing could not possibly be a whale. As for it was far too large and long. The creature, which was now uh, was recognized as a sea serpent, resurfaced a mile in distance, and the chase was on. Seabury recorded the events in the later, uh, in his letter, in uh, he recorded the events in a letter he later entrusted to Captain Sturgis of the bridge G- Gypsy for delivery to New Bedford while he was still at sea. Mm. So we're gonna get into his story. So basically, it kind of starts out with this, uh, the three year thing from the song. So these whale ventures. Mm-hmm. Were literally like sometimes two to three years long. Dang, that's these guys long, would be on the sea. Long work hours. Uh, oh yeah, so they were they, they were breaking down the carcasses of these whales on ships. Uh, it's crazy. It was messy. Mm. It was disgusting, and it's a man's job. Well, you you would be in trouble. Uh oh, why? Because you're a small man. Yeah, that means I can get in all the tight little places. Exactly. Oh, that kind of trouble. Okay. Uh, so what they would have these little guys do, and sperm whales, why sperm whales are so targeted, is not only did they have the blubber to melt down for normal whale, or right. they had spermaceti inside their skulls. Spermaceti? Yeah. So it's used to, it comes from a misnomer where they used to think sperm for sperm whales were stored in their head because it looks so similar to sperm. Mm, okay. But it's actually a highly combustible lubricant. Uh, it has all these industrial uses in this day. Huh. It's not as big as the whole oil packet of the blubber, but it's highly more valuable. Yeah. So to extract it, hmm. they would carve a little hole into the flesh and skull of this animal, and make somebody of your stature go inside and get a bucket and, and get it off. out. Mm. That sounds like, yeah, that would sound like an awful job. Oh, it was, the whole thing was disgusting. Yeah. And then that was the worst part. Man, see, I already have the jobs where they make me crawl into the floor and, and squeeze into the tight places. But the places. floor is not a rotting carcass yeah. into a skull. So I imagine in that, ugh, it's even worse. And they would literally, sometimes the men that would go to get that sperm study would die yeah. because the clamps would slip that were keeping the whale's skull like, and carcass open, and they'd slam shut, and they'd suffocate or be crushed in there. In a, in a whale skull. Yeah. Ugh. Okay, what a way to go. Uh, it's horrible. And that's why they had like six or seven guys that were really small in the ship, like kind of stood in the line. Yeah, I like firing squad. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah. Because most of the time, these men got stuck in these positions on these whaling ships uh, because they owed the company money mm. for all the tools and all this stuff. So it was this like where they never got out of debt for yeah. working on a whaling ship. Working on a whaling ship in this time of the ni- at the 1850s was considered the worst job. That's what you did when you were basically, you did it because they would feed you and you had somewhere to sleep. So it's the ice crab fishermen now. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Except the ice crab fishermen take checks home. Well, yeah, true. Like decent checks, and they only work three or four months out of the year. Hmm. These guys are on ships for three, three or four years. Yeah, so even worse. Okay, no days off. The heart. See, we're getting too soft nowadays. We gotta get toughened back up. Go fight whales. Go fight whales for three years. All right, you ready to hear from the captain? Yeah, the skipper, captain. Yeah. Wait, no, wait, skippers. Yeah, never mind. In uh, Gilligan's a skipper, right? Yes. Okay, gotcha. So he says, "I rush to the deck." And at first look, not a mile leeward, rest the strangest creature I had ever seen in the ocean. It was apparently still, but shotting up and down. So kind of like you see, like like it just kind of sitting on the surface, like an alligator or a crocodile when they bob in the ocean. Okay. Uh, up and down. And we are, we say of sperm whales, the same kind of thing. I knew it was not a whale. The head I could not see, but the body... 
had a, or had a motion like that of a waving of a rope which sank in and held in my hand. Every eye in the ship regarded its activity attentively, and not a word was spoken or a sound uttered. In a few minutes, the whole length of the body rose and lay on the surface of the water. It was a truly enormous length, presenting an extreme, or from extremities or tail moving or vibrating, undulating in the water. And the head rose entirely above the water and moved sideways slowly. And the monster was in agony or suffocating. It is a sea serpent, I exclaimed. Stand by the boats. There was a hesitation, and the mate said, Of what use is there lowering for him? We would only lose time and gain nothing besides. So basically at this point, the crew's kind of pushing back a little bit, mm -hmm. saying we're a whaling ship. Not a serpent yeah. hunting ship. Yeah. What are we going to go? Why are we going to go try to hunt this thing? Mm -hmm. Any ideas? Well, I guess uh, for riches. I don't know. Hmm. Maybe the hide. Just the hide? Or I guess the meat too, but I don't. I wouldn't eat the meat. So the captain says, I abruptly checked him and ordered all hands to the craft aft. When they had mastered, I told I wished to try this fellow. I urged them to follow the elongated uh, or the apple. Uh, I all that I possessed, all the courage basically I possessed, telling them that there were about few who believed in the existence of sea serpents anymore, and that I wished that be experienced that the whaling ship might fall in with one of those legends. That if we did not attack him, and we should tell of seeing him, that when we go home, we should be laughed at and dreaded. And the very first question would be, why didn't you try him? I told them our courage was at stake, our manhood, and even our credit for the whole American whale fishery. I concluded by applauding for them and their capabilities, holding out that there might be possibilities of getting him in some south port. I do not order one man to go into these boats, I said, but who will volunteer? Let me see their credit. Every American in the ship stepped forward at once, followed by all but one native and two Englishmen. Mm. So he's just saying, basically, now that we've seen this thing. We got to get it or else we're going to get made fun of. Yeah. Yeah. And he said it's also, so keep in mind, the world's hunting whales at this time. Right. So he's talking about for the American whale fishing units that this would be a great prize. It set them apart. Yeah. Put them on the map. Yeah. That's right. All right. And it really recruit some new whaling keep uh, mind, vessels. Yeah, these guys are hunting whales, and this is bigger than any whale they've ever seen. Right. Yeah. So this is for the the guts and the glory. Any ideas what it could be so far? Probably a big giant sea serpent. I don't know, big eel. Well, I mean, what do you mean by sea serpent? Eel, eel, or just big sea snake? Okay. Or like a sinkhole sam. Out on vacation on the beach. Yeah. After so, they start chasing this thing for over hours. Uh, Seabury had engaged with half or with him within half a mile of the monster in order the long boats to launch. So basically, they're chasing it with the main ship. Yes. The guys are sitting in the long boats, which are man powered. Yeah. Waiting to get close enough to launch. That's how you have to spear it. Gotcha. Oh, wait a minute. Eels don't hang around the surface that much. I don't think it's an eel. Oh, okay. Seabury <laughs> took, the, took the lead uh, boat along with a harpoon, James Whitmerman of Vermont. Uh, this is actually a pretty famous harpoonist. Okay. Uh, as they venture closer, they sunk two harpoons deep into the side of the creature, which seemed to take no notice of them at all, until suddenly its head and tail shot out of the water and turned its mighty jaws towards the closest target, Seabury's longboat. Uh-oh. So it, they stab it twice. Yeah. Doesn't act like it's caring a whole lot. Yeah. Until it raises its tail all the way out of the water, this massive tail. And its head. And its gigantic head full of teeth. And it's swinging, trying to launch on this boat that oh, the wonderful. captain's in. Because keep in mind, even when they're hunting whales, 99% of the time, whales don't fight back. Okay. Whales just try to run until yeah. they bleed to death. Mm. So these a lot of these guys aren't used to stuff. Fighting back. Turning in with teeth. Yeah. So. Man, why wouldn't a whale just fight back? I mean, it's so, not in their nature. Yeah, it's crazy. For the most part, there are accounts. We're going to be like training whales to... There's a book called Whales on Stilts where they train them to fight back and they give them laser eyes and stilts and they take over the world. Oh, wow. It's a book. <laughs> it's a book. It's a book. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. You ready for the next captain's notes? So yeah. the boat's about to get eaten by Destroyed this Destroyed by this thing. Yeah. What's, what's going to happen to him? The frightfulest head of this creature as it approached the boat filled the crew with terror and three men jumped overboard. I would not be jumping overboard. No, that's the last place I'd go. 
I instinctively held out the lance, and the sharp point entered the eye. I was knocked over and felt a deep churning in the water around me. I rose to the surface and caught a glimpse of the writhing body and was again struck and carried down. I partly lost my consciousness under the water, but recovered it. And as I rose again in the bloody foam, the snake had disappeared, and I shouted, Pick up the line! Pick up the line! The third mate, Mr. Benson, caught a brief or caught a blight at the line near the end, uh, which is like a big knot in it. Yeah. And bent on his, which is the intense beginning of taking out the rapidly. So basically, it, the line is just ripping out of this out of, thing. Yeah. The mate picked up or picked me up as soon as I rose to the surface, and after a few minutes, we were all picked up. One was severely bruised, and another was uh, irresensible. So basically, he was crazy. Okay. But he recovered, and both are now well. The snake had been taken out tons of line. The third mate in I was an I or the third mate was taken. The second mate, and when I ordered the mate to bend one and give the li- or give his line to the ship, the snake was sur- or was uh, sounding. And I cautiously, or I continued the officers that not to hold on too hard for fear of drowning or drawing out the irons. So basically, during this process, they're trying to get the line, the main line, to the big ship. Okay. Let the big ship wear this thing out. Yeah. So, it's but not that. hold too much tension either, because they're worried about pulling the harpoons out. Gotcha. So there's kind of it's this game. Okay. But you still got to follow it, but kind of have the brakes on. Gotcha. Okay. Where was I? So yeah, and then. It roared during this. Yeah, I heard that. It was writhing in pain. Mm-hmm. He said, "The snake sounded." Uh, so I was obli- or I was obliged to get up a spare line out of the foyer, uh, holding and bent on, for fear of the ship would its weights of the line drawing in the irons. I put on several drags and gave up the line to this mate. When it became stationary, there was now out four boats line, two hundred and twenty-five fathoms in the boat. In two thirds of another line, a hundred fathoms or more, all in over a thousand fathoms and six fathoms in the fathoms, so six thousand feet. That's a lot of fathoms. It's I about six thousand feet. Can't even fathom how. So much better that is. than one mile in an eighth in distance, an enormous depth. So this thing is dived down over a mile okay. already. It's going pretty much like Maybe straight this eagle. down. Oh, it feels obviously feels comfortable down in, there in the depths. Yeah. One mile. Uh, the pressure at that distance is incomprehensible. I was now below or below furious, and I, or I secretly dared to carry a sail enough to keep the ship up, and the boat was in, uh, in peril, and I was obliged to take the line in the ship again and run the risk of the iron strawing. So basically at this point, uh, it's dragging. It's going to drag them down to the bottom of the ocean. Right, yeah. So they kind of like, okay, we got to put more tension and tire it out faster or it's going to drown the boat. Yeah. I made up to the end of the line fast and took out a sail, but enough to keep this uh, keep it sturdy, and waited in the alarm of the snakes rising, the parting of the lines, and the iron drawing. At 4 p.m., the wind began to shift, which favored us a little. By 5 p.m., it was our great joy being uh, at that abrupt. At 8 p.m., all of a sudden, lull, the line taunt. Mm-hmm. What do you think so far? So they got this giant snake thing, whatever, serpent on the end of They're their... They're calling it a serpent and snake. Yeah. It's kind of interchangeable. Yeah. And they got it on the end of their harpoon or whatever. Just one? No, yeah. they have three harpoons three hard... now. Okay, okay. They got two in it immediately, and that's then they right. got an they extra the... one in before it started diving. Yeah, that's right. All right, so it's got a, it's got the lines all pulled tight, and it's down deep. Mm-hmm. But yeah. this very at the very end, suddenly a lull, the line taunt. Just wait. It just stops. Okay. Just, yeah, it's just it's kind of wait. It's not pulling anymore. It's just heavy. Yeah. What do you think happens next? It's going to come back up to the surface. With a vengeance? I hope so. You hope so? Yeah, I'm making it for an intense story. It is an intense story. Hours later, the creature finally resurfaced and seemingly harpooned to death and was tied up along the Mongahela. Oh, it's dead. Yeah, it I, died down. I, it bled to death, which is how they killed the whales. Uh, they just wait till they died from bleeding and then dragged them up on the ship. The crewmen stretched the, uh, stretched the creature and took note of the oddity that lay before them. Seabury quickly jotted down notes. So this is actually, if you want to believe this story happened, we have some extremely good measurements coming up. Okay. Uh, they took really good measurements of this creature because they were doing it for whale harvesting as well. Yeah. So they, they had the equipment to do it yeah. already. Yeah. So I'm prepared a minute in the description of the serpent. I will merely give you a few general points. It was a male. I have no idea what he meant by male. How could he tell? I have no idea. 
Okay. I'm assuming it had some kind of genitalia or what he assumed was genitalia. Okay. Keep in mind, these guys 50 years before thought sperm whales kept their sperm in their head. In their <laughs> True. Good boy. You got to remember that. Just keep that baseline yeah. thought. Okay. These aren't marine biologists. Yeah. Let's be. No they George, know what a whale is. I will give them that. No George Costanza's on this ship. Okay. So it was a male. The length of 103 feet, 7 inches. Wow. So rivaling the current largest blue whales on the planet. That's really, really, that's pretty long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and unlike our classic sea serpents, this guy's big. Uh, he was 19 feet around the neck. So circumference. Dang. He was 24 feet around the shoulders. And in inches, there's change with all these measurements. I'm just kind of making it. So he's 19 feet around the neck, 24 feet around the shoulder. So that's like that's uh, gigantic. 12 feet across at the shoulders. I mean, probably. I mean, something like that. It's, something, it's enormous. And then at his widest point, his belly, which seemed to be distended, which could be uh, barotrauma, could have caused this from yeah, being so from deep diving. being pulled up. Yeah. Uh, 49 feet, 4 inches. This is, I can't even picture that's this. That's roughly my head. 25 feet across. Yeah. Ish. I can't even picture this in my head. How oh, big the this size is. of a whale. It's the size of a blue whale. Gosh, dang. Now, here's where we get into the fun description parts. So, you got kind of a general size. So, kind of put up a, a, a pretty big blue whale up. Okay. Kind of fit that to your model with a big be pot belly almost. Yeah. Uh, but the pot belly could be from barotrauma, which is just pressure trauma. Right. The head was long and flat. Long and flat. With huh? ridges. And bones of the lower jaw were separate, like that of a snake. Mm. The tongue had the end, like that of a head of the hearts. I don't know what that means. So this long tongue it had, this yeah. long thin tongue, the tip of it was split, but it had big round edges on each side, like the like a, the head of a heart. Okay. Is, this, is that anything in nature? Just we'll like get it? there. All right, keep going. The tail ran nearly to a point on the end of which was a flat, firm piece of cartilage, like that of an oar. Okay. So a big, more like a crocodile or a sea snake, not a whale or anything like that. Right. So it's more like a big, like a big flat piece of cartilage. The tail ran... Oh, I already read it. The back was black, turning brown on its sides, and then yellow on the center of the belly of the creature on a, and a narrow white strip, two-thirds the length of its body. So it goes from black to brown to yellow, yellow. to white. Dang, okay. Uh, but there were also scattered dark spots along the body. On examining the skin, we found, to our surprise, that the body was covered with what seemed to be blubber, like that of a whale, but it was only four inches thick. So keep in mind, you know, some of the whales have feet of blubber. Mm -hmm. The oil was clear as water and burnt nearly as fast as the spirit of turpentine. Ooh. So they purified the oil like they were doing with the whales, yeah. the, the blubber. And it was nothing like whale blubber. It was burned way better. Yeah, it was yeah. burning like alcohol. Yeah. Uh, we cut the snake up, we f but we found great difficulty as it had a fissile to him. The body would not re roll, and the blubber was so elastic that when we stretched it 20 feet by the block, and when then we would cut it, it would shrink down to five or six feet. Wow. So okay. have you ever seen how they strip down a whale? Uh-uh. So literally they start at the top and they start peeling the skin and blubber off, peeling the skin, blubber off, and they cut them in big like meat chunks. Okay, I have seen that, yes. So they were doing that with this thing, but it was so elastic they couldn't do it. Yeah. And by the time they cut what they thought were 20 feet off, it would only be 5 feet. Yeah, it's, it's shrink back or, mm -hmm. you know, bind back, back together. Yeah. Uh, we took the head, such a frightful object, in our endeavors to preserve it with salt. We saved all of the <laughs> bones, which the men were not only or were not done clearing yet. In cutting open the serpent, we found pieces of giant squid and a large black fish. So blackfish isn't the species of blackfish, not it's a grouper. Oh, some okay. type of giant grouper. Uh, and the flesh was dripping off the bones. So it's been in there for a minute. One of the serpent's lungs was three feet longer than the other. Okay. Like, why is that? We'll get there. It's like a flounder or something? That is the... Just hold on to that. The one ser one of the serpent's lungs is three, three feet, feet longer, longer than the other. Okay. That's odd, isn't it? I think so. Mm. Mm. I should have observed that there were 94 teeth in the jaw, very sharp, all pointing backwards, and all as large as one's thumb to the gum, but deeply and firmly set. Uh, we found that it had two spout holes, or spectacles, 
so it breathed like that of a whale. Hmm. So it had these these nostrils uh, more like towards the top of its head. Yeah. As we we found it. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. It also had two. Or it also had four swimming paws, or the imaginations of paws, if they were like that, but hard and loose flesh. Hmm. So they're a mixture, kind of like imagine if I how I picture it. There's fingers that are hard, and the webbing is loose. Okay. The muscular movements of the sea serpent after it was dead, made the body look like it encircled by latitudinal ridges. So, uh, like, like these... had ribs, basically, kind of? No. Uh, so, you know how, like, Sicilians, the, the uh, salamanders, and, like, how worms have these muscle groupings that are look like make them look like they're made of tires? Yep. They said after it was dead and started to coil, it looked like it had those latitudinal muscle groups. Oh, okay. So these big groups of muscles around the body. Yeah. Uh, almost more like an eel or, or a salamander. There's a lot of an- different animals that have that, but it's a very odd characteristics. There's a lot of odd depictions in this. A lot of good sure. factual stuff that helps us kind of pinpoint what this animal could be. Okay. If you believe this story even happened. I'm narrowing it down in my head. I think I'm getting there. Uh, but So basically, the crew of the Mangahela went ahead and rendered the carcass down as completely as they would with any whale, but taking great care to prevent the head or to preserve the head as evidence, and indeed encountered a sea serpent. Shortly thereafter, the Mangahela stumbled upon the bridge Dipsy. The captain, Seabury, handed off the letter detailing the circumstances surrounding the battle, the sea monster, the gypsy captain, who eight days out from uh, Ponce, Puerto Rico, was heading there to Bridgeport. Seabury's letter was delivered to the new entity or new entries. The Mangahela had been out of port for over two years and wasn't expected to return for another year. And the newspaper accounts were published. So no direct confirmation from Seabury was possible. So basically, his mm. buddy's going, like, he's eight days from going back home. Yeah. These ships are out there for three or four years at a time. He's like, I still got a year and a half out here. You know, well, you just tell everybody what we found. And he showed him the, the head. He's like, I'm not lying. Here's the head. Yeah. He's like, okay, can, you know, we go take this letter and tell everybody that there's still sea serpents out here. The Mangahela killed it. Uh, so the Mangahela had not been for, out of for, uh, port, blah, blah, blah. The Mangahela would never be seen again. Mm, what happened to him? Although the reports of 1855, there were other whalers and the small amount of wreckage clearly identified as being the Mangahela were found near the Arctic Circle. Yeah. Where do you go? Looking for more monsters? and So there's a lot of... So vengeance. Was it vengeance by an angry counterpart of the sl- slaughtered seas monster? We may never know. Whaling ships sank... All the time. Yeah. It was fairly common. A lot of these, especially these smaller ships, mm-hmm. so the Mangahela was not among these giant, like, industrial class whalers. They were, like, more of your mom and pop whalers, if you want to go like that. Which makes it even more impressive to catch this thing. Oh, it's probably why they sank. Okay. It's probably, uh, the, the ship was literally, during this battle, at the very edge of what it could handle. Yeah. And then they probably went out and bumped a sperm whale, and it fell apart. <laughs> uh, but no, so... No evidence besides this letter. Okay. Uh, and this other captain of the gypsy coming forward and saying, yeah, you know, I seen it. I seen yeah. it. They, sh- they had the skull. Like, it was in, you know, they had everything. Everything in this letter is true. They showed me all the stuff. Yeah. They did w- find what appeared to be the wreckage of the Mangahela in a whaling, like a whaling school. So other boats seen the wreckage of a boat. Okay. Uh, keep, like, I think it was two in, like, one in three whaling ships on these three-year voyages would not return. That's pretty bad uh, odds right there. Yeah. <laughs> That's like pretty the Essex, bad odds. The, famous, the most famous shark attack ever, uh, which was also, they all sank because of a whale attack. Mm. The same kind of years. I think it was actually 57, so a couple years later. Uh, they almost sank four times. Until they finally Until they sank. stole a whole bunch of tortoises. And then a whale, the only whale, that one of the few whales that ever reported of actually turning tail and attacking the ship. Yeah. And let all the tourists. It was the biggest. uh, Supposedly, it was the biggest sperm whale ever seen. If the measurements were right before it sank the boat, huh? Uh, And some people lead it to be the high fin sperm whale. Uh huh. Yeah. So, any thoughts? What are your thoughts? I have another story for you after this. Well, I mean, what with the same creature? Yeah. What do you think about a similar creature? I think I know what this thing is. Okay. I want to do some highlights for you, though. Okay. Some parts of the description to really look into. Split jaw. Yep. An unfused jaw is a very important indicator. This forked tongue. The blubber. In four paws. Mm. Giant oceanic salamander. Is that your real guess? Yep. I don't think so. Oh. 
especially because the skin is extremely tough and the big the big skull full of teeth and the ridges and the salamander. bones. And All I think, salamander things and the lungs. One's one lung's bigger than the other. No, oh, I I did forget that off my list. Uh, the, yeah, the one lung is a really good is bigger than the other. Yeah. Uh, salamanders have a huge jaw. At least most species do. Well, the oceanic ones don't, right? Exactly. There we go. <laughs> there hasn't been there had there were oceanic salamanders, the giant ocean salamanders, but that was a while ago. So think more reptilian. Legless lizards. Good guess. Good guess. Uh, so there are species of animal that have a lung longer than the other. What would that be? There's specifically two groups. Okay. And the ancestor, or they split off from these two groups, actually got massive in our oceans. Okay. But we'll come back to that later. You're just going to tease everybody? Mm Mm-hmm. I have one more story for you. It's only a half hour on the show. You're going to tell everyone it's this big shark uh, lizard thing? Hybrid? Sharktopus. Yeah, it's a sharknado. Sharknado. All right, what's the next story then? If you're... Okay. Let's get to it so we can... No, I'll tell you that it seems to be some type of large marine reptile. Okay. The, the lung specifically. Snakes and some monitor lizards have this. Snakes often have one lung. It depends on the, highly on the species. You know, we're talking about a large group of animals. Yeah. Snakes generally have one lung a lot longer than the other. I did not know that. And some monitor lizards do. Why? Huh? Why? It's just some primitive throwbacks and stuff like that. Mm. Uh, it's There's all kinds of reasons, but we're not here to talk about that. The blubber, clarifying when it clarifies it, like mm-hmm. they're processing it, turns white or clear. That's reptile fat or bird fat does this. Ah, I didn't Modern know chickens and stuff like that is yellow because of their what we feed them. True. But yeah. wildish birds. You know, are more clear and specifically reptiles, these uh, like lizards, rattlesnakes, they can be clarified clear fat. Didn't even realize they had fat on them. Like Not that. very much. Yeah, but there, there are, there is fat. Okay. Uh, the so the split jaw once again, snakes and monitor lizards. That's how they swallow. They, unhi- they right. People Un- say they unhinge, unhinge their jaw. Their, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. actually they think it's in the back. It's actually in the front. They split that their jaw in half. So they make like a big wide box they can swallow. Oh, wow. I did not know that. Mm-hmm. Well, you've seen them when I feed my snakes. The jaws can move independently to work food in. I guess I never really noticed, though. Yeah. I never, I never watched you they're actually. Not, they're not fused in here in the middle like in our chin. I watched you put food in their things. I never watched them actively eat. And then the four paws. Mm-hmm. So it's four, not flippers. They just typed it as webbed paws. Right. So you, that to me means you can see the full fingers. And webbing in between them. So like a primitive snake before they lost their vestigial... So now do you have any guesses? Uh, Komodo dragon. Now, yes-ish. Okay. Now, this is probably one of three culprits, if you want to believe the story. Mosasaur. Mosasaur. Yeah. Plesiosaur. No. And uh, an oceanic crocodile. Okay. So those are all three culprits that we can kind of dive into. And we'll we'll talk about a story here in a second. But no, so the Mosasaurs were some of the biggest marine reptiles to ever live. They mm-hmm. dominated the ocean for a long time. Before them and during them were the Plesiosaurs. Now, there's two types of Plesiosaurs. Everybody knows, like, Nessie-shaped Plesiosaur, the long right. neck, small head. There was another one, like Predator X in Liopleurodon. They had gigantic crocodilian-like heads, four flippers, and were just monster predators. Okay. So the plesiosaurs were not these like swimming bags of meat, like are portrayed in these, some games and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Most stars are, you know, really scary in the south, but some of these plesiosaurs were absolute monsters. Hmm. And then the ocean, the giant oceanic crocodiles, you know, we did an episode on that. Right. Yeah. So Max Hawthorne's a famous uh, oceanic researcher for the cryptid and the weird. He did an article a while back. It was killer whale survives an attack from a living mosasaur. Ooh. So on on November 30th, a Facebook page uh, known as Carcadon Carcius, basically a great white shark page. Oh, okay. Or, yes, great white shark. Or is that Moses or Megalodon? I don't know right now. Big shark. a video of a pair of killer whales swimming through the sea of De- uh, Debris. The female, which was the main subject, was followed by a larger male that swam below her, keeping her company and presumably protecting her. The cow was visibly wounded. Her body riddled with what seemed to be puncture marks. 
that she was missing a good portion of her right pectoral fin. She was also extremely thin and malnourished. Peanut head being the term for marine biology used to indicate her loss of cranial mass. Mm. So she's she's thinning down. Something massive bit her. Yeah. Left puncture wounds and removed a good chunk, chunk. of her fin. Yeah. The following video, once again, was filmed, and you guys can look this up on Max Hawthorne's website by digital camera moving, uh, playing the shots. Uh, so basically, there's a couple culprits for this. The jaws of this thing were humongous. Uh, the lower jaw, perhaps 16 inches wide at the most. Uh, of a, so we're going to talk about this. Some people will blame a sperm whale for this attack. Okay. Saying that these whales could have been hunting a sperm whale calf. Sperm whales do have gigantic teeth, uh, only on the bottom jaw, though. Oh, okay. So you can't really bite and... Oh, they can. But make, uh, like, puncture wounds on both sides. Uh, as far as we know from the video, we don't know about the other side of the whale. Okay. So, yes, no. Yes, you're correct. We don't know that data, though. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the biggest sperm whales we have today are only 60-inch wide jaws. Okay. The one in the video seemed to be quite larger, uh, like, you know, a couple feet wide. The holes match, though. And the sperm whale at all this. Uh, but yeah. They zoomed in and they tried to work on it. And some people said megalodon strike, boat strike, shark bites. None of it makes sense. Yeah. Sharks, when they bite, they tear. Uh, even if it was a great white shark that was defending itself from being eaten from the orcas. They don't just bite and then let go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just the way they're... they're, they're, they're uh, right, they're built. Yeah. So this matches. Uh, the scarring pattern was almost eight feet in length. Uh, it kind of matches the macropredatory mosasaurs that have confirmed to be 40 feet, specifically Progothonodon, which is a type of mosasaur that jaw pattern fits these holes almost perfectly. Oh, that's uh, and Max Hawthorne did all these this this math all the, and stuff like yeah, all the measurements and yeah, okay. So there's those guys. What do you think about that so far? So I mean, they're speculating that the mosasaurs are still like roaming. Mm-hmm. Interesting. There's problems with this theory. So let's let's get into kind of what we think with some of the options for all these. And when I say the options for this, I kind of mean the general thing, this Mosasaur-shaped animal that's being seen. We did on Patreon a while ago, the Carnival Cruise Monster, yeah, which right. was both giant turtle-shaped, plesiosaur-shaped, or Mosasaur-shaped because the tail wasn't seen. Mm -hmm. That's the big difference between plesiosaurs and Mosasaurs. Mos is the tail. Is the tails. Plesiosaurs from like seals where they use their four flippers to get, like, to move, or turtles. Yeah. But they're really fast. Most sorts of, like, crocodiles being tail-propelled. Yep, the big, long, mm -hmm. yep. So what if this is what people are seeing? Is actually monster turtles. Ooh, well, I don't, I wouldn't think. We that. talked about it with the shark that went missing. Well, Remember yeah, somebody we stole a shark? Yes. And I'm talking about what we kind of consider classical turtles now. I'm talking about a much more predatory, fast Turtle right. that's living out in the open oceans. Well, I'm going to say no on this one because the first whole account was Seabury fighting the thing, and there was no shell turtle indicator whatsoever. So I don't think they may not even have shells when they get to the size, the, the species, that they may have evolved without the shell or lost the shell. Because the shell, uh, shells evolve pretty quick, and they can, you know, they can be even internalized yeah. to where it's, you know, behind flesh. It's well, just their ribs and their skeleton. It's just their skeleton. Well, then the other thing that would say no to me about turtle is uh, when they carved it up, you know, on the ship, getting the meat out, whatever portion out, they would have found seven different types of meat, and they didn't put that in their notebook. No, they did. No, come on. I didn't see it in the right footnotes. Here. Yeah. Uh, let me scroll Oh, all this way part back. tastes like roast beef. Obdermans, 1892. This is roast beef of the sea. <laughs> yeah. This tastes like chicken and ham all in one. Poor turtles. Don't eat turtles. It tastes good. So you're not you're not buying the monster turtle theory. I'm a, I'm, for this one, no. I do believe monster turtles exist, but not in this case. What if I tell you superfish? Just a big fish. Mm -hmm. Specifically, giant lizard fish. Oh. So we talk about some of these cryptids. Did you make that up? No, no. Okay. So giant lizard fish are real. They really look like like a komodo dragon with fins. Okay. It just sounds like something you just made up. Yeah, you can type them in. They, they <laughs> are dra see, dragon fish and all this stuff, but lizard fish are. Kind of more like in the reptilian, they're kind of monitor lizard shaped. Uh, a couple of these early accounts, I'm not sure we did them on Patreon on the main page, with like BB's abyssal fish. Okay. Yeah. His first one he ever seen was a giant deep sea lizard fish. And it was like supposed to be 20 something feet long. Hmm. And that could be this kind of split jaw, all these mandible parts, the long 
they could have not been understanding what they were cutting apart and it pulling out sw- organs. Could have been a swim bladder and a. Oh yeah, it literally could have been. Yeah. And something else. Uh, lizard fish are uh, adapt predators. Fish can get that big. We've had lead sick these and other fish get that big. They're mostly filter feeders though when they get that large. Mm. But it could be a hybrid of both. Yeah. Or defensive like, teeth are for defense. I'm gonna say no on this one as well. Oh come on. I feel like he would have known what a fish was. If uh, he's out there on the ocean, a hundred and three foot long fish. Yeah, I mean, kids still identify markers. Oh, that makes it a fish. You know something. Okay, okay, okay. Oceanic crocodile is my next one. This one could. I mean, I I couldn't rule this one out. I mean, there's not a whole lot as when we talk about uh, physically between yeah. a mosasaur and oceanic crocodile. No, there's not too much of a difference. There's pretty much the same animal. Yeah, do the same thing. Mosasaurs would be. So here's the kind of weird thing. So Mosasaurs split, which we'll talk more about in a second, from snakes and monitor lizards. Okay. But there's some evidence that they may have been warm-blooded. Mm, now how's that work? Uh, it's, it's, it happens in the animal kingdom. Okay. I was going to say snakes or, nor monitor lizards are warm-blooded, no, right? But, yeah, but so the coastal ones would have been cold-blooded like their relatives. But to get these more active predatory lifestyles, they either got to do it the sea turtle way of uh, maintaining kind of a body internal body temperature. Mm-hmm. Sea turtles aren't what we call warm blooded, but they're not what I'd call true cold blooded animals. Gotcha. They're kind of this mix thing. They maintain a lower body temperature, but kind of with more consistency. Gotcha. Okay. So their early ancestors probably did something like that, and then as they evolved and kept growing and growing, they had to get they got bigger, right. so it was easier to stay warm. Right. Makes sense. Ocean crocodiles though don't have this need. Uh, they do the other way of being cold blooded and just kind of hanging out until there's food present. And drifting with the currents until mm. they get to where they want to go. Then they activate. Yeah. Gotcha. These short bursts of high intense energy and then six months of basically nothing being turned off. Yeah. Uh, so what do you think about this oceanic crocodiles? I could, I mean, I, I wouldn't rule this one out. I, I just imagine though, uh, you would think the guy would, well, maybe he wouldn't know what a crocodile or alligator look like. Uh, I don't think the crocodiles and alligators that we're talking about out here, the crocodiles, specifically the oceanic crocodiles, mm. may not look exactly like. A crocodile. Our traditional ones? Yeah. yeah, okay. They're very different. They're they're adapted for marine life. I do think they almost have these flippers or these webbed toes more where they're because they're that's better for fine tuned swimming versus right, yeah. the big powerful tail. Uh I do think it could look very not fully alien. Right. But, but very different. different. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. I would I I'm on board with this one for, you know, a portion of it. Like could be. The color pattern maybe no not so much, but and the lung thing maybe not so much, but I don't know. I don't know how crocodiles do. Maybe aquatic ones have one lung bigger than the other. And there could be this whole thing with them uh, stabbing it a lot. Oh, true. And one of the lungs <laughs> kind of getting sliced. Yeah, I didn't think about that. Uh, they stabbed it a whole lot and like it died. Deflated. And then the other thing we haven't really talked about is the barrel pressure. Yeah, true. It could have blew a lung out. It would dive too fast. It's a defensive thing. Yeah. Like way deeper than it wanted to go or too quickly. And it blew out of the lung. And then that's how it died. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, can see that too. Barrow trauma is real. It happens to fish and stuff. They live at those depths. Either well, yeah, and again, not being if it was a fish, fish don't have lungs, right? No, but it's swim bladders, right? And people think they have like because that's what you see coming out of their mouth when they blow up. Like two, two of them though, they have two. No, but there could be mistaken organs and stuff like that. All right, yeah, it could have something could have swollen up, swollen up. Oh yeah, like the stomach dragging it up, or it could be at, like even basically a hemorrhoid. Pops up in the lining of the swim bladder ah, and okay. forms because it's, it's exploding right, essentially. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, plesiosaurs. Now here's one. It seems to me that a lot more plesiosaur shaped animals are seen versus these mosasaurs. Plesiosaurs had a lot longer run. They had a lot more species. Hmm. Uh, mosasaurs got bigger and were much more aggressive. And they they had a, they had a fair variety of species. They had freshwater, saltwater. They had big and little. Uh. But plesiosaurs were a lot older species, and they had the abilities. They survived a couple mass extinctions themselves. Okay. So this is the one where I think it doesn't really – it's it's interchangeable between the mosasaur and the plesiosaurs. It's really about this tail for the this specific account. I'm not saying a plesiosaur over – you know, the, you know, the dinosaur extinction. They're not dinosaurs, right. but that's when they were around. Right, right. Couldn't uh, uh, re-evolve quite a long, powerful tail. To make their way, like fill in that niche, mm-hmm. I guess. Yes. The fast swimming bursts of speed and energy to hunt niche. Yes. Okay. So what do you think that about that one? 
I guess I just don't know much about. I always picture plesiosaurs as being, you know, the typical the long neck. Yeah, that's. Do you know what a liopleurodon is? No, I don't. So, like, so imagine a mosasaur. Okay, you got it in your head. Oh yeah, without a tail. Oh okay, so pretty much the same looking. Okay, um, I guess yeah. I just don't know all the options of plesiosaurs. I didn't know they had a wide range, so and this one really wasn't on my radar. I guess you'd say, or my sonar for this. For this story in particular. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> Hilarious. All right. All right, Andy. I'm finally getting to it. He's bothered me about this one forever. All right. Mosasaurs. Mosasaurs. Survived the mass extinction, just like anything else. Uh, now, I'll tell you this with Mosasaurs. They could still be around. Ocean's yeah. big. Uh, the big drawback is high meta- metabolism rates. Mm-hmm. So these guys would have or could have split jaws. Some species did, some species doesn't. The longer lung thing that fits, the forked tongue fits, uh, the webbed paws fits. The size is a big thing. Like we've never had one get that big. Not saying they couldn't re-evolve right. to get that big. We just didn't have one get that big. Uh, right now, our pretty much our biggest one ever was forty set or fifty-seven feet. That we can successfully estimate there have been some partial skeletons of ones that people have some pretty wild estimates on yeah but who knows anything could be possible who knows anything could be possible but what do you so mosasaurs how they would have survived this mass extinction uh if you look at crocodilians so everybody said crocodile survival the mass extinction yeah not quite okay what we're talking about crocodilians is they literally fit they filled every niche and then like four percent survive and then they re-evolved to fill niches. Ah, uh, okay. And then 4% survive. Okay. Uh, like uh, Patagonia, not Patagonia, New Caledonia, just recently had a, a galloping crocodile, fully terrestrial crocodile go extinct last 3,000 years. Oh. Was not a member of the Jurassic ones, but it re-evolved to take this big cat niche. Okay. During the Jurassic, Jurassic and all this, there were big cat crocodiles. There were Borosuchus that ran down dinosaurs on land. <laughs> there were a literal dinosuchus, like these monsters, you know, these 50, 60-foot crocodilians that literally ate dinosaurs. Jeez. Uh, and what happens is they all went extinct Yeah, with well, the dinosaurs. I was just saying, no more dinosaurs yeah. to eat. Well, I mean, the small ones, like there was pig crocodiles. There was like these little armored boar crocodiles that were like little hippos. Hmm. Like crocodiles were herbivores and carnivores and omnivores. Like, and then the ones survived were the ones that could shut down their metabolism. For stick, six months at a time. Stick their nose above the ice and yeah. and just turn off. And just wait. Yeah. Or whatever you believe caused the mass extinction of the dinosaurs, whatever it was, killed everything, right. essentially. The only reason crocodiles, modern-day crocodiles survived is they could sit there and not eat for a year. Right, and be fine. And be cold or hot and just sit there in the mud or these swamps and just wait it out. Tough it out, yep. Eat you know something decent once a year Yeah, and just wait it. My big problem with mosasaurs, and this is a lack of evidence, because we don't, you know, we don't have a specimen alive today, or do we? We don't know. Uh, they don't seem to be able to do this. Do what? To have this metabolism slow down. There are plenty of freshwater ones, and there was plenty of saltwater ones. There was plenty of estuary ones, big and small, like you know, from the monsters of the open ocean to these these crocodile-sized saltwater or these estuary ones mm-hmm. to ones that you could you know carry like a largemouth bass that lived in ponds and lakes. Right. Yeah. They all seem to have fairly active lifestyles, which mm. would lead more to a fairly active diet and this metabolism. So you think they'd be seen more often if that were the case? I don't think they survived the mass extinction. Okay. Or would have a lot more trouble than something like our basic crocodilians that did. You know, they did, you know, because they need food regularly. Right, right. right. Now, saying this, the best cha- case scenario, uh, there was freshwater ones that were tiny. Mosasaurs? Yeah. Okay. And I mean tiny. What's tiny? Like three feet. Okay. Like a fish, like a catfish, like you're holding up a catfish. Nice. Now, let's say they survived and then re-evolved back into oceanic giants. They have all the genes to do it. You know, Mm -hmm. they could. Mm -hmm. That'd be my big push for Mosasaurus, surviving into modern day. What's your thoughts? Well, I I think anything in the ocean can survive just about any cataclysm. Doesn't matter what it is. I think as long as if you can dive down deep enough, I'd say you're pretty safe from just about every natural disaster apart from like a... Underwater super volcano going off right under you. You know, other than that, so you're pretty dang safe. Pretty dang safe. Yeah. So I don't. I wouldn't rule it out for one to survive or make it, because you got. You know, you got plenty of food in the ocean always. Mm-hmm. Always giant, some type of fish or mammal living there to chew on. Hmm. That's just yeah. I don't. But I don't. Who am I? But no, it could really. Know. It could really. I mean, like you're saying, I agree. 
That's just I'm giving some pushback because yeah. I think what people are seeing is I I'm, I'm a big proponent of oceanic crocodiles. You think that's what they saw? Yeah. Hmm. Is a gigantic crocodile. Crocodiles have tongues. Yeah. Like that? They have hard palate tongues though. Uh, no, uh, no, but oceanic might be different. Mm-hmm. Could be. And I could definitely see a mosasaur surviving in modern day. Uh, it doesn't have to. I just I have more trouble believing it. But there's there's all the same possibilities that anything survived the mass extinction. Like wait, wait, you say that again? There's a possibility that anything could, like like anything could survive the mass could, extinction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just yeah. Birds I think made I'm, it through. You know, all kinds of weird stuff made it through. I think the highest probability of things making it, as far as big creatures, is definitely the ocean. Oh yeah. And there were there was problems with oceanic animals. I mean, big problems with oceanic animals, as, especially as the fossil record fossil records concerned. What were they eating for a while? You know, big fish and stuff like that. Yeah, or, I could definitely see more likely a smaller species surviving and then re-evolving into the monsters. Which, yeah, it but a hundred and three feet. That's pretty long. That's rivaling the biggest animals to ever exist. Yeah, it's pretty. That's that's like a hyper predator. You think that thing would have probably snatched? And that's up his the boat. problem. And we're talking about. These other guys that are this size, they're filter feeders. Yeah. Yeah, if this thing is eating meat, he so needs a lot. So let's talk about that. Uh, most of the mosasaurs, uh, let's get to there. So there are species like ichthyosaurs, which were like the reptilian dolphins, mm-hmm. plesiosaurs, which took all these other things. Uh, mon- or these mosasaurs are mostly closely related to snakes and monitor lizards. Uh, they were some of the largest organisms of their time. Uh, the largest predatory reptile, Mosasaur Hoffman, is one of the largest known Mosasaurs, averaging 39 to 42 feet long. So just about large orca size. Okay. So they're big. Right, but not 100. And... But not blue whale big. Right, yeah. You know, orca, not blue whale. Big difference. As adults, and some may have reached 57 feet length. That's some f- fragmented uh, fossils we have and such. So now we're talking medium humpback whale. Still not hitting those blue whale sizes. Still big, but not that big. Even the smallest of their numbers was about a meter in size. So once again, three feet. They could have one of them in a tank in the back. Yeah, the same size as small shark species, uh, like uh, bonnethead sharks and such. Can we CRISPR a mosasaur back to life? Ah, probably. I think we could. I think we could just put fins on a, a monitor lizard, and he's pretty much 90% there. there yeah. <laughs> just tape, get, tape get, fins. Get an iguana. We'll tape some fins on him. Throw them in the tank in your backyard. Done. So <laughs> some benefits is that the oceanic creatures are not nearly as limited to their sizes. Constraints such as gravity, buoyancy cancels out this downward pull of the earth. Uh, you can see this today with the largest animals ever to exist, you know, of all time, the blue whale. Uh, that's, you know, no exception. The lack of constraints is likely also a factor which allows these mosasaurs and other marine reptiles to reach massive sizes. Mosasaurs also have a double hinged, flexible jaw much like snakes, mm. which means they are not constrained by the size of prey they're eating, less specialized animals. So this is a point in their bucket of saying, yes, they could have survived. Because let's say they evolved, they found a really large piece of food. Uh-huh. They could just eat it all. Yeah. You don't have to worry about other animals coming and eating. They could unhinge their jaw, essentially, so swallow it whole. And be done with it. Yeah. So they can punch a little bit above their weight class with swallowing food whole. Like a big whale carcass. Or, you know, a big chunk of it. You're right. Yeah. Any questions so far? Uh, no questions. What if, what if the guy that uh, wrote the story, the sea, the seaberry story, um, knew about the mosasaur and created this tale to fit it? Could be, could be, could be. And we've had other sea serpent ones, uh, like the uh, the Gloucester sea serpent. There was one that got hunted there. Forgot about that one. How do you say it? I think you were right, Gloucester. 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 I don't know. They yelled at us. Everybody yeah, yelled at us. Everybody. Everybody. So the earliest were also, those earliest mosasaurs were also the smallest, but the smallest of these being Daliosuchus, or Daliosaurus, I'm sorry, only being a little less than three feet in length. A far cry from the, you know, 45 to 50 foot monsters that swam later. Mm. Daliosuchus, though, Daliosaurus was a unique among mosasaurs for having a plesioperidactyl set of limbs which means they could say in the distant fingers underneath their flippers, presumably still capable of walking on land and digging burrows. Oh, that's scary. Credit to it surviving. Ah, okay. That if its ponds dry up, yeah. it could get out and walk to another pond. Yep. And so, so on and so forth. So 
I guess what I'm getting at is there are still there are possibilities for this thing to survive. He's still out there. Well, not this one, not the one that they cut up and was peeling blubber off and melting its fat down that and cut its head off and showed its skull off. That one didn't survive, but. Mosasaur as a whole. He's still out there. He's still alive. So Tylosaurus is also our lar- one of our larger Mosasaurs. Uh, this thing ate everything. Birds, sharks, fins, ammonites, uh, and other Mosasaurs. Wow. Oh, dang. Okay. It actually was one of the few animals that could crack open the giant ammonite shells. How do they know this? Because uh, they found the crushed up shells in their guts. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. Pretty good answer. Mm-hmm. It's, they even had scales. So scales has always have been known to fossilize in impressions. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, Bruce is our largest, com- almost complete skeleton at 43 feet long. Uh, he actually has his own clade. They lived during the end of the Mesozoic 90 million years ago. So way before the end of the dinosaurs. Okay. Uh, that's pretty much, do you think, so do you think Scarberry killed this monster? Yes or no? Seaberry. Scarberry's Mothman. <laughs> Um, part of me wants to believe yes that they did it. I do. I don't know, but I don't know. It's pretty. It's pr- definitely a fisherman's tail, ain't it? Oh yeah, hundred and three uh, feet long. Yeah, that's why I'm like, God, it's, it's a little. But th- there's a lot of details in it though that l- lends it to being true. But now keep in mind, let's say the gypsy captain made up this story. Okay. Like he made it up. Okay. And was writing about the ship that he already, let's say he knew it was down. Yeah. So he knew nobody could, uh, could uh, dispute it. Dispute it. So let's say he did that. He took whale measurements for a living. So he knew. He knew roughly how big a 100 foot whale would be and yeah. kind of matched it to the monster. I could definitely, I mean, yeah. If anyone could fake it, it was the guys, these guys. Yeah. Like the whalers, the mm-hmm. people who are always out there catching giant, um, what, what just giant creatures on the or regular? Or even if let's say he talked to the captain, he talked to Seabury. Yeah, uh, the gypsy captain did. Got the story, and the creature was fifty feet long. Long. Yeah, sixty foot long. Yeah, let's scale it up for. And then the ship, you know, later it went down. So then he turns in this letter of the story, and yeah, fisherman tails it. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, you know, get get a few more book sales out of that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they were selling books. Well, so what's your thoughts? Sales. Final thoughts. Yes, it happened. Yo, it <sighs> happened. You know what? Yes, it happened. I believe it. What Mosasaur is still out there. I was going to say, so what the next question is, what is the monster? It's a Mosasaur. Mm-hmm. It's it's not a giant salamander, oceanic salamander. I didn't even have that one on my list. <laughs> the reason I said that was because, I don't know, I thought the lung thing might be weird. The feet and the hands and then the colors of it. Like a lot of salamanders don't have lungs or only have one lung or have gills. Oh, see, I was on to something there. Yeah. So the newest weird. Oh, yeah, they have weird lungs. Yeah. A lot of them don't have lungs. See, I mean, I was on to something. They just breathe through their skin. It's just a little off. But I'm going Mosasaur. That used to be a prank in dissections. What? In college, when you had to dissect salamanders. Whereas the teacher would put, because yeah, you got to find all the organ groups. Yeah. And find lungs. And they'd put, no, oh, they're never on there. They're, they don't have lungs. Yeah. It's a pretty good one. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Got him. And then everybody, everybody had it marked. Really? Everybody would find some weird little lump of flesh and be like... Lungs. Lungs. Yeah. That's really funny. I'm going... That I do think this happened. Ah. I do think that... A Mosasaur is a possibility. Oceanic Crocodile is also a possibility. I think it's one of those two. Maybe even a Plesiosaur. Are you going to pull some crazy thing out of your hat right at the end? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. What is it really? No, I mean... Oh, okay. Mosasaur is pretty crazy. Okay. I thought you were going to have something else intense, like... And then uh, I do think that somewhere, I don't know if it was Seabury or who, somewhere along the lines, the story got blown up. I do not think this animal is 103 feet long. Exaggerated upon? Yes. Yeah. Fish I do not tails. think this animal is 103 feet long in any way, shape, or form. Because blue whales struggle to get that big. As big as he was saying it. And they're filter feeders. Yeah. It's not they don't like have predator. these gigantic teeth, these predators. The way he was describing it, too, if that thing like reared up and turned its head, you know, after stabbing it in the eye, I feel like. They'd been dead. Yeah. 100% had been dead if it was that big. Now, or, a 50-foot one. More manageable. I mean, you're using a 10-foot-long stick to, you know, stab him to death. Yeah. So it's a little more, more distance versus a 100-foot one. Right, exactly. And it diving down, you know, thousands of feet. Um, If it was that big, I feel like it would have just yanked their boat under with a 
Like, oh, yeah. I mean, there's a reason a lot of these smaller shoot. whaling boats could not go after blue whales in some of them. Exactly. Because so, they would just take you. So I mean, there's some... So we're both agreeing there might be some nuggets of truth to this story. I think the, the tr- core, the tr- story in its core is probably true in some way, shape, or form. They had some kind of large marine reptile, whether that is a mosasaur or a crocodile, uh, or even some kind of really like primitive snake. Because there were chewing snakes for a long time. Mm. Uh, that group went extinct a long time ago. Did you say chewing snakes? Yeah. Okay. Snakes that didn't swallow their prey whole. They actually had like fixed teeth. Oh, okay. And they could chew. Mm. Like it was really weird. It was just like pretty much. It was a very odd group of animals. Okay. We may cover them one day if I can find the right cryptid to explain what a chewing snake. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, but no, it's just a, it's completely odd. <laughs> a chewing snake. It, nature's produced monsters for a long time oh yeah mostly oh, humans but as evidence we shared here all right i've been the great and powerful mystery i've been jay clone all Whatever. right you guys have a good week bye bye thank you for listening to crypts of the corn podcast please share with a friend you think would like us it's the best way to help our show grow leave a comment rate us a five-star review and remember there is always extra content on Patreon slash CryptoTheCorn.com. And don't forget, stay magical.